Greetings all, Frog here. Let's play some Crusader Kings to the Horse Lords. I've got good news, and I've got bad news. The good news is the Horse Lords are here. Yay! So we're going to be playing Crusader Kings to the Horse Lords. This is the latest DLC, and this is the first video in the series. So this is great. That's the, the good, happy, positive news. And we're going to talk all about the Horse Lords, and it's going to be a beautiful, brilliant thing. The bad news is I've already done this once. This is the second video I'm recording. The problem happened is that, for some reason, Audacity chose not to record the volume, the audio. I'm gonna... Yeah, it's recording now, so I don't know what happened the first time, but it didn't, it didn't record. Um, so I just had video. Luckily, I, it be, me being who I am, I spent the, almost the entire first video just talking about how excited I was about the Horse Lords, all the things I'm looking forward to, explained a little bit about how CK2 works, explained why we picked who we picked, and then we didn't, I hadn't actually made any decisions in the game. Not a single day has ticked by. Nothing has actually happened. So in terms of like putting it on the channel, you didn't miss anything. So it's not like the gameplay is gone. It's just I spent a half hour talking about how awesome this game was and how excited I was to play. And it's gone. Sorry about that. I will be drinking today homemade caffeine-free soda. So the... Um, the, the, the crux of it is, I could have recorded over that video, but it would have been a little too complicated. I've done this once already before, and I just, I didn't, I didn't like it, I didn't like the results, it was too complicated. And frankly, I didn't move my mouse enough to know what I was going to be talking about at any given time, and things would have been awkward, and so we're just going to start over. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the game. We're already here, uh, we'll talk about who I picked, why I picked them, and we'll talk a little bit about the differences between CK2 and EU4, because most of my viewership that has come here for Paradox has came before for EU4, so we'll see how the CK2 Horse Lords thing uh, comes out. If you already know about CK2, uh, just bear with me a little bit, and just be excited that we are sharing this with more people and bringing them into the fold. So, we are going to be playing today, and many days into the future, as the Magyar. So, the Horse Lords added a bunch of stuff for the nomads and these essentially are the nomads all of us just a little bit more out to the side too i think all i think yeah i think all those guys are nomads so they added new content for the nomads that are different than if you play a feudal lord so crusader kings 2 unlike eu4 is set in um a, a farther time back so we're actually starting in the year 769 and we could play up to 1452 so we can play uh, nearly 700 years of game so it's a much longer game than is EU4, and actually the way that they have it, I can then convert this into an EU4 save file, load it up, and then keep playing until 1821. Which we might do, I don't know. Uh, maybe we do it with a custom nation, I'm not sure if we're going to do it with the Magyar. But here's my reasoning between behind why I picked the Magyar. One, it's the Horse Lords, so I'm not going to play one of the Catholic nations. I'm not going to play one of the Islamic nations. I'm not going to play one of the two Jewish nations, because they are wicked difficult. Um, but I am going to play instead as a horse lord. So I could have picked an easier horse lord. There's no doubt about that. Kazaria probably has the easiest start, just looking around. I'm not sure. The, the Uyghur might have an easier start. It's tough to say. It all depends on what their provinces look like, or their, their counties, rather. Everything's a county in this game, they're not provinces, but I will call them provinces probably for quite a long time. Um. I think Azaria probably of the Horse Lords has the easiest time of it, only because they've got a bunch of weaker neighbors to the north, which we do as the Magyar as well. We're definitely stronger than Kiev, Severia, Radomichia, all this, these places. But they can relatively quickly uh, combine into Ruthenia, so it's a matter of does it happen or not. And then also Novgorod ends up, you can form a long time from now, but we'll see. I mean, you know, it all depends. The history gets modified greatly. But it's relatively strong. The Byzantines are down here. So that's a bit of a concern. The Abbasids are here, but at the same time, you've got the the um, Ukilid, Ukilids in the way. And the Byzantines and the Abbasids don't like each other, so as long as you leave them alone, they're going to fight each other anyway, so you're okay on that. And then these guys aren't really much of a problem. If you play as the Yag Yag Yagweed, then you will probably end up at, with the, at war with the Abbasids at some point, um, or one of the Sheiks, certainly, and, and it'll be very, very messy. So Kazaria is probably the better choice. Why didn't I take Kazaria? For a number of reasons. Uh, one, probably the biggest one, is that Aruma's playing Kazaria. So why would I want to play the same one that Aruma's doing? Not that we can't play the same series, because he and I definitely have different play styles. Um, but it's, at the same time, like if you want to see all of that stuff, 
why not watch what he's doing? So I want to do something a little bit different. Also, because I'd like to watch what he's doing as well, and I don't want to see him doing what I'm doing and thinking, gosh, I, you know, I could do that better, or gosh, he does that better than me, blah, 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 blah. Sorry about that, guys. I am going to drink quite a bit. It'll get better when we have gameplay to mask all that. You probably never noticed how much I actually drink in a video, but I can drink a lot, especially when it's late at night. I'm recording this at 11.30. Uh, I can't remember already if I said this in this video or not, but this is this is late at night, and I've got a really early morning meeting tomorrow, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hate myself tomorrow, especially since it's probably going to end up being like an 11-hour day at work, but that's just the way it goes. Um, oh, hello. All right, cool. The map, the key bindings actually work in this one. They don't work when you're in the country select mode. Okay, anyway. Uh, those are all the different map modes. We'll talk about those later if we need to. So, that's why I picked the Magyar. Also, because I think the Magyar end up with the form hungry decision. I haven't looked at any of these menus yet because I just started. So, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. So, let's look at through my holdings. And we'll notice right away I have all of these empty holdings. This is on purpose. This is what we want. We want those. The only thing we have is our county capital. Everything else is empty. Like, throughout the entire land, everything is empty. This is good, because we're nomads. We want this. I could build a temple. All right, that's the one thing that you can put in here, because we are religious, but for the most part, we want all of this, because it gives us more manpower. So, this is his county. Uh, ca county capital. This is the Charjan clan. I do have one clan, aside from mine, so we are a bi clan or society. Excuse me. Uh, and we're, we'll, we'll talk about all of uh, how that works. Uh, let's go up to the interface. We'll talk about the interface, and we'll come over here and describe some of the differences between EU4 and CK2, and then we're actually just going to get started. So, so there we go. Uh, up here, we've got the time. So this is just like time before uh, your plus minus. It doesn't have the nice little dial in the corner. It just does the straight line, which is fine. It's perfectly good, perfectly serviceable. This is the outliner. That's the same thing. Uh, it shows very similar things. Um, we could say what messages we want and all that stuff. Um, but we'll, we'll worry about that later. I don't need the outliner out all the time. Here is our, our... Go higher. This is our population. This is how many people actually live in the area. And as a nomad, the higher the population, the stronger we are. So our population is currently 9,000 out of a maximum of 27,750. Uh, we're going to gain 187 population every month. And that's based on 1% of our potential population growth. So it will slow down the closer we get to our population max, which makes sense. Uh, the population is based on a base uh, constant of 1250, and then you multiply that by the number of uh, holdings that you have, and then subtract 2250 for manpower reasons. Essentially your army, because that's now our manpower limit is 2250. So we have 1850 out of that, we can gain 400 more, we gain 10% of our monthly growth percentage. Uh, to create, I'm sorry, our maximum to create our monthly. And then the maximum is based on a base of 0.25 times the current population base times 9,000. So there you go. That's what we got. So the bigger population, the bigger manpower. That's ducats, buckets and ducats, and ducats and buckets. Um, it actually goes to the thousandth place, so that's, I guess, nice. We gain three tenths of a ducat a month. Oh boy. There's our prestige. It works similar to EU4, but is much more important in CK2. It can also be spent because we're a nomad. Uh, piety is just a religion, religion, we're chaste. Oh, I should have noticed that. Uh, we'll talk about why that's bad in a moment. This is our vassal limit. We have 0 out of 23 vassals. Our vassal limit is based on the fact that we're a Kagan rank, which is essentially just like a, an emperor. So that's our base, which is always 1 times 30. And we get 3 more for a ruler diplomacy bonus, and then we lose 10 because we're nomadic, so we have a 23. But we lose 10 because none of our nomadic vassals count. So I do have a vassal. It just doesn't count against our limit. The realm size is nine counties, five of them are mine, four of them are my cons, and then this is our score. We have no score. You get score in this game by adding up the total prestige and total piety of a successive character on death. It adds to the score. The highest score is the best that you can do. All right. So over here, these are essentially the F1 plus then all your number keys, one, two, three, four, five. These are actually hot keyed to F3 through F9. That's not F10. Very frustrating. Wish it were, but it's not. So sad, so sorry. Uh, up here, this is are the flags that drop down. They become little buttons on the top, which I actually kind of like the this. We get the same as the Norse, so it's the wooden uh, backgrounds. I think they look better than the stone that you get as a Catholic country, but we'll get to there. Um, this game, unlike EU4, is character-driven. EU4 is country-driven. This is character-driven. 
What that means is that all of our interactions will be between the characters, not the countries themselves. So if we die and say we our heir does not inherit Magyar, but our heir is still alive, we will continue to play. We just play as a different title, whatever that might be. So we have a title loss on succession. We will lose the cognate of Magyar to Khan Tarjan of Tarjan. I don't know why yet, but we'll figure that out. Uh, one title can be created. We can create the Duchy of Paraslavl. And I believe that we can do that because... Um, I'm honestly not sure. Because I don't think you can create just willy-nilly duchies. Um, but maybe you can. But I, I suspect that might be because we can form Hungary eventually. Uh, we are unmarried, so let's fix that. And this is where I ended my last episode and realized that I had nothing going on. So you can see I just crunched 30 minutes down into 10. So you're lucky or I'm sorry, depending on, on your point of view. So we'd like to arrange a marriage. Ideally, we want somebody highborn because um, we just it gives us the best prestige. So there is uh, there is no princess. These are all priestesses, which is a shame, but that's okay. We are Hungarian, right? Yes. So if we could find a Hungarian uh, person, that would be great. But essentially, what we just really want is somebody that's Tengri. Um, we don't. Well, there could be some other pagan religion, but we just don't want any Catholics in here because boy, would that be awkward. How'd you like that for bed talk, huh? Um, we haven't talked about any of these because we just started, but every character, because this is character driven, every character has traits and abilities. So um, they, they get five numbers. This is your raw score. It's your computed score because there's things that modify this already. Excuse me. And the way that this is done, there's essentially five categories. Diplomacy. That affects the character's opinions of you, and it's important for things that we have a chancellor. We have different court positions. We'll talk about that because that's one of the things up there. Is it not? Yeah, I think it's that one. Um, Marshal is how good you are for fighting. Stewardship is how good you are at uh, running your country. So that controls taxes. Intrigue is how good you are at doing all the spying and killing and assassinating. And learning is basically how uh, smart you are, and it affects rates of technological uh, progress. So we have these base numbers. You can see I've got my base numbers here. I'm a 126096. So I'm not very good at stewardship. And then you have a country score or the state score. So the state diplomacy is 26 because you take my score and add the score of all of my counselors. So in this case, it's the counselor that is the diplomacy, which is the, uh, what do they call them actually? I can't think. The chancellor. Yes, of course. So it tells you, you know, you get that added to you. When you get married, you get half of all your wife's stats. Unless your wife is one of the counselor positions, and then you get half of all her stats for everything except the position that she is, and then you just get her full stats. Which is why it's almost always more profitable not to have your wife be the spy master, because you're losing half of her score, essentially. Okay, um, these are the different clans. So we probably want to pay attention to what clan we want to align ourselves with. Um, the Yabguid Cognate, the Empire of Turkestan, which is pretty good. This is the Cognate of Tumen. Uh, I'm not sure where that is, but we can always look for the symbol. And this is the Cognate of Yike. Yike is up there. They're pretty small. So they're not going to be as helpful. Tumen. Where are you? Yes, I could hit the F key to find it, but I'm not going to because I'm trying to be smarter than I should be. Okay, where are you? F does not find in this game. Hmm, that's unfortunate. Well, we'll figure out where that is later. I could click on it, I suppose. Where are you? You're up here somewhere. Um, okay, well, whatever. Those are the three Empire-level tiers, you can tell by the little crown. All these are just cons, so we want to try and stay away from these because they're not as prestigious. We want prestige. So, what are the types of things we're looking for in a spouse? Well, we want good numbers, first off. Especially a number that would help offset our stewardship deficit. The other thing that we're looking for is uh, age. They're kids until 16. So, at 15, you're a kid. At 16, you are not. So, it's a year later than the Regency information in EU4. Uh, so, right off the top, the two good candidates are both 14. Well, that's not good then. We'd prefer that not to happen. We would actually want somebody who's already a breedable age. And then you can actually have kids until 
I think it's 45. I'm not sure, but it's up It's up there. So we, we got that. So we want age. So we're looking for numbers, and then we're looking for age. Then we get to see, do they have good traits? All right, when you're an adult, you get this book. So she's a thrifty clerk, so loses diplomacy, gains some stewardship, and plus fertility. Fertility is good, especially because apparently I'm chaste. Did I read that right somewhere? I am, which is not good. Being chaste is good because it gives us piety. When piety is good, it makes us smarter, and everybody in the Christian church likes us better doesn't really matter for the Tengri. Um, but we lose 15% fertility. Which is not great. We are a gray eminence, however, so that almost counteracts that by itself. Um, I lose some martial, but again, intrigue, diplomacy is the big focus. There are five different categories, and you've got five different types of um, levels. Uh, gray eminence is the top level of this type. So that's very, very good. We had a good education. We're arbitrary, which is not great because all vassals don't like us as much. We are envious, which is kind of okay. And we are honest. Hmm. Honest and envious. Very interesting traits together. And that gives us our base score of 126096. Uh, honestly, I think Urga is going to be the best choice. She has combat modifiers, which doesn't matter because she cannot lead combat in our faith. She's a thrifty clerk, which is not a great education. She is lustful, which is great. So she's got plus 25% fertility. She's paranoid, which is not always the best. She is brave. That's probably how she gets her combat modifier. And she's ambitious, which could be bad for us. You get plenty for your skills, but um, you've got... <sighs> she might be trying to kill me off to put her son on the throne, so I've got to be careful about that. And she is in this thing. It would uh, result in an alliance with the Kagan of Tumen. Which is the one I don't even know where it is, so that's fun. But that's okay. Uh, she's probably the best choice. We can take more concubines to get alliances elsewhere. But this is, this is I think, what we're going to start on. I think that's what we're going to do. So we're going to right-click on, on anytime you want to interact. You right-click. We'd like to arrange a marriage. We're going to get six prestige for marrying in this house. And we're definitely not going to make it matrilineal because we don't want her. We don't want our titles to pass to her line. So there we go. We have a wife. Anytime you want to get back to you, you do that. Now, that won't clear away until I let time tick, and I'm not going to do that yet. Vassal Inheritance Warning. Um, on death, these titles might pass from your well realm. So that's the same thing, title loss on succession, Vassal Inheritance. But this is for other people. So um, what this is saying is that if my Khan dies, that title might leave from the realm. Because the heir of that title is not in our realm. Go away. Um, just dismiss for now. Thank you. Same thing with you. You can just go away for now, and you can just go away for now. That's the difference between clicking and shift-clicking to get rid of it in EU4. Um, I already know I'm unmarried, so we now need to pick an ambition. All right, so we have to have, like, what are we going to do in life? Well, let's let's see. What are our choices? Our choices are to get married, become an exalted among men, which gains a lot of pious, become a paragon of virtue, which is gain a lot of piety. Sorry, this is prestige. This is, this is piety. And amass wealth. Well, let's get choose the ambition to get married. Because we desire to get married, and we're going to fulfill that ambition in just a moment, because we're going to get married. Um, we need to pick a character focus. This is new with the Way of Life, so if you played Crusader Kings 2 but did not have the Way of Life, then you're never going to see this. Um, what this is, each of the five categories again, so we've got our diplomacy, we've got our um, learning, we've got stewardship, we have uh, intrigue, and uh, warfare. We could pick from one of ten paths. So, like, we could gain theology, which gives us two more learning. The temple vassal opinions are plus 20, which we don't have. So that, and, and then we get a bunch of different life events based on theology. Well, that's, that's no, not interesting. Scholarship is kind of good, just gives us learning. Um, basically, each of these has something that gives you plus whatever. So, plus three. And then there's another one that gives you plus two and, and a bonus. So I might want to take family to counteract chase. Uh, plus it gives you health and diplomacy. That's tempting. Um, that gives you health. Seduction gives you fertility. Mm, seduction is always fun, but for this first one, I think we're going to focus on the family. So I'm hoping to get better relations between family, which is good in a clan environment anyway. And then I can grant the commander of the Magyar, uh, which are the different people that can lead my troops. Essentially, uh, I can... These are all different special... This is new. These are minor titles, so it used to be that you'd click on one and then you'd say, I'm going to sign this to you, and then you'd forget who everybody was. So now you actually, there's a place where you can see everything. Uh, I have a commander already. 
excuse me, he is actually really quite good, so he's probably going to end up becoming my marshal. But he is uh, one of my commanders, another commander, and I can appoint two more, so it's the same commander point two. These are the only people, along with me, who can lead my armies. Then I have these different special titles. I have a Kunder, who is a traditionally high-ranking official in the Khan's court, and bestowing it on someone is a sign of approval. I have one available. It gives, comes with a salary and prestige um, gain for that person, and then a uh, plus opinion for them of me, so that's good. I have four Ishads, which is the title given to the highest-ranking generals, and as such may be regarded as a mark of honor. That's very similar. Uh, a Yabgu, Yagbu? One of them says Yagbu, the other says Yabgu. Figured out. Um, that's even better. That's a huge, huge mark of res res huge mark of respect. It's bestowed upon the second highest member of a ruling clan, often a brother of the Khan. And then I could have a regent, which is if I if we need a regent, so I become incapable or something, then that person will take over instead of the game randomly assigning me one, which is nice. I'm not going to actually assign any of those. That's been 20 minutes already. This this is just this is crazy. We got we got to get into this. I'm explaining too much. But I like this, and it helps get everybody on the same page. So, assuming the audio recorded this time, and I don't have to do it all again, we will see you next time. Otherwise, I might be pulling out all of my hair. And I do actually have a fairly nice uh, head of hair right now, so I'd like to keep it all. Um, next time, we will play. Time will tick, I promise you. Time will tick. Uh, so, we're, we'll go from there. I hope you liked this episode. If you did, click that like button. It really helps, especially as we start this new series, uh, to get views and likes uh, into this area to try and build the conversation, right? This is all about the back and forth. This is about building the community here at the pond, and I hope that you, you are interested in doing so. If you would like to, consider subscribing to the channel. It'll keep you updated on everything that's going on here. And until next time, cheers.